Right, so I hope you can hear me. Good morning, everyone. Um, nasty wet day for most of us. Good for staying in and talking to people on Zoom. Um, yes, as we alluded to, there's a couple of points there. Um, we want to pick everyone's brains about the future. Um, how many services we should be having in the church how long we continue zoom who wants to come to the church should we have a service every week or every other week or once a month so we're hoping sober will join us during the coffee time after the service and we will have a chat and take a little bit of a vote to see who's who's wanting to do what i mean i know it's a very awkward time and with the virus resurgent maybe um we're heading in the wrong direction but anyway we thought we should ask your views and a bit of good news that uh, liz was alluding to um we found out on friday that hayley kennard has got engaged to her fairly long-term boyfriend cam so they've made it official she's got a very nice ring that uh, cam designed apparently so uh, that was being flashed in front of the quiz attendees on uh, Friday evening. So let us, without more ado, move on and welcome Peter Wally to our pulpit. Should we call it pulpit? Yes, we should call it virtual pulpit. Um, so welcome, Peter, and I will get your picture up in just a moment. Okay, good morning to you all. Thank you for your welcome, Mike. Our call to worship this morning. As a gardener prepares and clears the ground for the vine, so that it may grow and produce good fruit, Help us, O oh God, to prepare ourselves to meet with you in worship, that we too may grow and be fruitful. Amen. And our first hymn this morning is Lord of the Dance. It's number 247 if you have the hymn books with you. approach God in a time of prayer now and in our first prayer there is a, a line that uh, you can join in please 
when I say, for Christ is the vine, if you can join with me, and we are the branches. For Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. Let us pray. If a planted vineyard represents peace, because it takes time to cultivate the crop, when there are good relations with neighbours, may we live by patience, tolerance, and understanding. For Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. If a single grape represents plenty, because plenty comes through harsh pruning, training the branches to grow productively, may we be nurtured and guided by God's Spirit. For Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. If a glass of wine represents God's blessing, it is a cup of sorrow which will not pass until God's will is done. It is a cup shared in holy communion, one with another. It is a cup of light-headed celebration. For Christ is the vine, and we are the branches. Amen. And a prayer of confession, after which we will say the Lord's Prayer together. God, lover and care of us all, often we are like that vineyard that fails to produce good fruit. We acknowledge that despite the love and care you show us, we have failed to extend the same love and care to others. We are truly sorry that at times our lives have been more akin to wild grapes than a vintage wine. Do not give up on us. Do not lay us to waste, but prune away that which is dead. Clear away the stones that prevent our growth and rain upon us your living water that we may produce fruit worthy of you. Amen. And we're going to say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're now going to have our Old Testament and Gospel readings for this morning. Our Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> Let me sing for my beloved a love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He digged it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make a waste of it it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, and behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. And the, the gospel reading is from Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Here another parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to tenants and went into another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. 
and the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same to them. Afterwards, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruits of it. When the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees heard his parables, that they perceived that he was speaking about them. But when they tried to arrest him, they feared the multitudes because they held him to be a prophet. Thanks be to God. And now we'll sing our next hymn, which is from Singing the Faith, number 351, In Christ Alone. <laughs>
We're going to consider each of these readings in turn this morning, and we'll start with the Old Testament, Isaiah's Song of the Vineyard. How does this relate to our lives? Well, the first thing we can see at the beginning of the chapter, how God cares for his vineyard. And in the same way, he cares for us. Often vineyards were found on a hill. There'd be a wall or hedge surrounding it in order to keep animals like wild boars, jackals, and foxes out. As well as for the protection, there'd be one or two towers of stone in which the vine dressers lived. This way, the resident could see any danger that would be glooming about. A large vat would be there, dug and carved out of the rocky soil. There'd be a need for a large press in which to smash the grapes. So God has done everything possible to provide for us in the same way. How has he cared for you? What way has he provided something like a wall or a hedge, a place of refuge, a place for us to reside? It also, he would have prepared the ground in which we take root and perhaps even carved out the rock so we can work and minister in whatever way we call to, rather like the young man in this story. There was a night, perhaps a bit like the last couple of nights, a very stormy night many years ago in um, the, the town, American town of Philadelphia, where in a small hotel, uh, an old couple arrived after midnight and approached the front desk, hoping to get a room for the night. Could you give us a room here? The old couple asked the young clerk. The clerk was a very friendly man with a winning smile, and he said, unfortunately, there are three conventions on in town, so every room is taken. And seeing how disappointed the old couple were, he said to them, but I can't send a nice couple like you out into the storm, so I'm very happy that uh, you take my room for tonight. It's not the best room, but it'll be comfortable enough for the night for you. The couple refused, but the young man insisted that they stay, and so they agreed to. Don't worry about me, he said to them. I'll be just fine. Anyway, the next morning, the couple came to thank and thank him and say goodbye. And the old man said, you're the kind of manager who should be manager of the best hotel in the United States. Maybe one day I'll build one for you. The clerk and the old couple had a good laugh about that. And the old people went away, just commenting on how helpful the young man had been. A couple of years passed. The young man forgot, almost forgot about the incident until... A letter arrived with a return ticket to New York. So he went and met the old couple again. And he recalled how the events of that stormy night. Anyway, the old man took him to the corner of Fifth Avenue and 34th Street and pointed to a great new building there, a pale reddish stone with turrets and watchtowers thrusting up to the sky. That, said the older man, is the hotel I've just built for you to manage. You must be joking, the young man said. I assure you I'm not, said the older man with a big smile on his face. The older man's name was William Waldorf Astor, and the magnificent structure he was showing the young man was the original Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And this young clerk would become the first manager. His name was George Bolt. So the young clerk never foresaw on that stormy night in his small hotel, the turn of events that would lead him to become manager of one of the world's most glamorous hotels. Secondly, God expects fruit from the vineyard, and he expected good grapes from his investment, not only to have expectations met. What type of fruit can we produce? There are two types, good, sweet, and bountiful fruit that's worthy of God and true to his goodness, or fruit that is sour, it's not palatable, it would not even be able to use to make anything. What does God expect from us? What kind of fruit does he desire from us? He wants to have the best that we can produce. He wants to have a sweet reward from the investment that he's put into us. And I quite like the story about Alfred Nobel who lived in the 19th century. You may recall he was a Swedish chemist who'd invented dynamite. So during his lifetime, he made millions of dollars from the manufacture of high explosives. His invention so magnified the killing power of weapons that some people trace the history of modern warfare to him. Now one morning in 1888, Nobel opened his newspaper only to find an article about his death. Now it was his old brother that had died, but a careless editor had run the 
uh, more famous Alfred's obituary. Now this was quite a shock and revelation for Alfred Nobel because he could now uh, see what his peers thought about him. And much to, much to his uh, disappointment, the article about him portrayed him as the dynamite king and let him know that he'd be remembered as a merchant of death who made a fortune by making war more destructive. His legacy to the world would be more efficient methods of killing people. Alfred was dismayed about such a prospect and he was determined to do something about it. So uh, under the conditions of his new will, he left more than $9 million to found five prizes to be distributed yearly in equal parts to those who were judged to have contributed most to helping mankind. So thus the man who'd invented dynamite forever link his name with the cause of progress and peace. How will people remember you, a person of integrity, as one whose genuine faith produced the good fruit of Christian behavior? And like with Alfred Nobel, we can choose how we will be remembered. Thirdly, God judges the fruit. And if you, the, the last few verses of that first reading tell us how disappointed God was with the fact that although he did everything, the vineyard did not produce good fruit. And so God decided that for this vineyard, it would be burned, it would be break down its wall, it'd be trampled on, it'd become a wasteland. What can be done with rotten fruit? What can be done with wild or sour grapes? Nothing, they're no good for consumption. You can't make wine with them, you can't eat them. Simply God cannot use them. The whole, they have to be destroyed and the whole vineyard has to be destroyed. Otherwise, it will continue to produce the same kind of fruit. That is God's judgment. There were once two men who robbed a jeweler's shop. Now, one had been a lawyer, while the other was a high school dropout. After being arrested, convicted, and sentenced, the former lawyer received a 10-year imprisonment, while his accomplice, the dropout, received three years. The legal team for the lawyer protested the harsh judgment, but the judge insisted that the lawyer was under greater responsibility to be an example of the law. And in like manner, we who are Christians and of Christ's church are under a greater responsibility to be living examples of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's grace is upon the faithful. Those who remain in Christ, those who bear the good fruit, are the ones who have the hope of the gospel. We are the ones that have the hope of life eternal. So let's celebrate this good news. Let's remember to be forever sweet for God's glory. But our lives do need a cutting edge for us to bear the good fruit that Isaiah wants. wants. So let us now consider this in relation to the New Testament reading, the reading about the greedy tenants. Now, in the same way, when Jesus told this parable about the vineyard, all his listeners would have clearly understood who the vineyard referred to. To any Jew in the first century, the vineyard as in the case of the Isaiah reading, was used to signify Israel. So once we've identified that, that the vineyard is Israel, the rest of the reading rolls out very simply. If the vineyard is Israel, the landowner who plants the vineyard, planted the vineyard is clearly God. Now the Jews are always very proud of the fact that they and they alone were God's chosen people. Now it doesn't take much imagination to see that the wicked tenants represent the leaders of Israel. And the servants, well, again, the servants are those sent by the landowner, in other words, God, and they represent the prophets. And then, of course, the landowner's son is Jesus Christ himself. But now, in the reading, Jesus suddenly changes tack from speaking about the killing of the son of the landowner to speaking about the stone which the builders rejected. And in the English translation, a, a play on the original words is missed. In Hebrew, the word for son is ben, and the word for stone is heben. So, of course, there's a link between the son of the landowner, Jesus himself, is the stone that was rejected by the Jewish leaders of that day. And I think it's the link that brings a modern day context to this parable for us. Jesus quotes from Psalm 118, verse 42, when he said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected 
has become the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. So a final question just for us to ponder today is, what is Jesus today to us? Is he the stone which the builders rejected? Or is he the cornerstone of my house? Is he the cornerstone of my life? Then we will produce good fruit in our lives. And Paul sums us up, sums up this fruit in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, when he says, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God expects his people to bear good fruit. Amen. We're now going to have Ian lead us in our prayers of intercession for this morning. Good morning. There is a response in the prayer this morning. When I say, Lord, in your grace, will you respond, guide your people. Lord, in your grace, guide your people. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you in the knowledge that you hear every one of your children and that your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, told us to pray and take our needs to you. Lord, in your grace, guide your people. Lord, you know of these troubled times that all of us have both shared and individual sorry that all of us have both shared and individual needs in this crisis we ask oh god that you guide the world and the national leaders to work together with scientists clinicians businesses and financiers to conquer this virus whilst moving our joint economies to a more environmentally sustainable base Lord, in your grace, guide your people. Help us all, Lord, to learn the behaviour that will safeguard ourselves and those around us and to keep to that behaviour. We particularly think of children who cannot understand why they can't play and act as children. Also, adolescents and young, people, young adults who know they personally have very little to fear, but often don't realize the harm that they can do to the more vulnerable members of our society. Lord, in your grace, guide you. your people. We pray, Lord, that you will be with those who work for the well-being of all, especially the needy in society. For clinicians, cleaners, support workers, and all those that help our essential services keep running. Protect and comfort them, Lord, for they often do their work for very small rewards. Lord, in your grace, guide your people. We pray, Lord, for all church leaders with the problems of supporting their congregations and explaining that God still loves them even at this time. We especially pray for those we know, our own ministers and lay preachers. And we pause to remember people that we know doing God's work to ourselves. Lord, in your grace, lead, guide your people. We pray for all those who are sick or in distress. And we pause to remember those we particularly know.
and as we, and we ask for your continued comfort to families who are bereaved, particularly for Roy and Lean, and any others who have recently died. We ask your blessing, Father, on all those who are facing major life changes. A new job, perhaps the first job, university, a new school, moving away or marriage. We particularly think of Tim and Elena and family, and also of Haley and Cameron, as they have committed to a future life together. Lord, in your great grace, guide you. your people. We ask all these things, Lord, through your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we say our, our final prayer, can I just say that I know you're having about to go into a meeting and we're going to go off to see grandchildren in London, so I will leave you uh, soon afterwards. Um, there are only six of us, so uh, we'll be okay. But uh, thank you very much and let us conclude our service. As we return to a world of wonder, may you go with the power of God the Creator, the imagination of God the Storyteller, and the wisdom of God the Spirit. Amen. <laughs>